I wanted to add to all the other announcements. Um, this weekend is also what in China is called 1010, October 10th, 1911, the end of the Qing Dynasty, the rise of the Nationalist Party, and a whole bunch of uh, fun-filled historical craziness too, too long to talk about here, but which led to the revolution of 1949 the results of which we're dealing with now. <clears throat> Weather advisory. When rain is the subject of prayer in places where drought and famine are accompanied by injustice, war, the dishonoring of women, corruption in all places, cracks in empires barely known, yet too well known. When prayers for rain are uttered in such circumstances, such times, expect a thunderstorm of sand. And I'll have more on my forecast at 11 and all other hours day and night, without stop. It's called Everything Gets Catalogued. A young black prisoner walks off the grounds of minimum security camp in Pennsylvania, is on the loose 18 hours, is apprehended by some man who's the town sheriff, justice of the peace, notary public. Later, two weeks later when he gets out of the hole and is now in maximum security behind walls and razor wire, he learns what a goddamn fool he is. Why every God-fearing white Pennsylvania Deutsch Lutheran man was oiling his rifle and his beloved wife was pouring through the Sears catalog in high speculation over how the $50 reward for that black man's hide, dead or alive, was to be spent. That young black man went on to write this poem. And in the years between then and now, also learned how white Sears so the urban legend went, stole black Robux, share of the enterprise. And thereafter, Sears, true to the ads and the catalog, had everything. I wrote this poem when I moved into Redwood Gardens, 19 months after I plank myself here on the coast and did a lot of surf couching and stuff. It's called setting up base camp on what's left of the coast. And uh, 18 months of sleeping on comrades' pillows and sometimes in their beds, living in barrack style situations and doing work as an honorary asylee has come to this moment the long-awaited studio where, in past weeks, books, papers, cassettes, CDs, slowly finding new homes within the new home. The dishes and clothing are few in easy matters. Small closet and kitchen cabinets and shelves. The books neatly fit in the more cavernous closet. Tomes that the owner had forgotten existed double copies of some things, though less than what was anticipated. The sum total of both books sent ahead via package delivery in a re recent yet so primordial past. And more recent tomes accumulated in the year and a half fit neatly into the space with room to spare. Also found in the unpacking Letters from self and from friends from over four decades ago. 
some still, others dead, still others well. And transcripts from undergraduate years all reflecting states of mind in various years, all together a sobering of if wild journey through one's person's synapses. In the letters and cards of farewell from comrades, friends and colleagues, reminders that on that other coast, much had been given, and therefore much is expected out here. Studio is secured. The unpacking has been easy, but still maddeningly slow. Much like the unpacking of good scripture and good polemic to audiences, needing and maybe ready and willing to hear. This room will be a base camp, a locale from which to send forth words of class war marauding. Yanan in Berkeley, Moncada in Oakland, Smolensk in San Francisco. The spirits of those who came before us now looking upon those of us who today would be comrades in the struggle to change reality to our needs and our likings. Their fingerprints worked in ink and paint and grease and in sweat and blood. The evidence is all over the place if one chooses to look. And this letter of a wannabe poem is out to proclaim. Opening shot, yeah. Leninism lives. Let no one tell you different. I'm going to read one from my book called Itching for Combat. It's about seven of them over there. If one wishes to purchase one afterwards, I will sign it. They cost $10. The po name of the poem from this book is called Would Do Haiku for Food. <laughs> what would Karl Marx do? Hotly pursue Feuerbach, cliff notes to Hegel. What would Lenin do? March our mind, will, and honor into our party. What would Stalin do? That depends upon your needs for saint or demon. What would Mao do? That's 70% question reformulated. What would Trotsky do? This depends upon your need to blame or to praise. What would Rosa do? Of which one are you thinking? Pax or Luxembourg? And what shall we do to keep our minds occupied, our, lay, our hands on the plow? Chinese restaurant. This took place in Boston over 30 years, nearly 30 years ago. He was white. In his late 40s and taking supper in Copley Square while working a Sunday swing shift gig. He spoke as loud as any American overseas tourist to the young Taiwanese sisters, interspersing stupid jokes that he thought Asians would find cute, along with more would-be serious talk, angling toward a subliminal pass, verbal pats on the behind. And the women, who understand English spoken well or merely good, softly or loudly, waited upon the barbarian with a smile 5,000 years long and light years deep in judgment upon yet another fool. This is about Cafe Trieste in San Francisco. Part one, this is in memory of Owen Chandler. Um, who was a conga drummer here in Berkeley. And one night he went off, um, fired off all kinds of shots, 
in a uh, in the neighborhood with a rifle, with a semi-automatic rifle, and then took his own life. And he was um, he's he was a well-known musician and very much a part of the community. It's called Cafe Trieste. Part one. Back after a quarter century, one block above Grant and Columbus, Italian operas, movie film scores, Tony or Frank, whoever, all blaring in their jukebox turn. At the tables, the young gifted and mostly white, out impressing each the other with how much they know in the realm of gossip and also how much they really know. Others studiously, intently literary and literally staring into the laptop non-existent computer, not the laptop non-existent a quarter century past. A literary and artistic spaghetti western. Fast forward in time on steroids, tanked on espresso, pasta, pasta, fast draw. Part two. It started out as mama and papa, then kids. And now, red balloons hover above faithful audiences, extended, family, 40 years in the making. Red balloons hover over congas, accordion, bass, piano, guitar. Sort of Buena Vista social club, but mostly Italian, mostly matinee. In these time of cyber burial of all things considered, suspected of being human, seven bucks a small price to pay the musicians, breathe in the ambience, open city on an afternoon of the bowels of Arnold's Reich. Musicians in the family singing once a month, calling us, calling us. Some of us remember Gramsci, Mattiotti, Pasolini, calling, 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 open city, year one, refoundation, calling, calling, calling. Malcolm the X, a college teacher was amazed. Mouth open wide in astonishment when the young blood presenting his discussion of black leadership of the 60s made reference to that great black hero, Malcolm the 10th. Now this might well be commentary of some kind about what we know and certainly what we've yet to learn. But then, certainly we could have used nine others. Spelling Bee. On television, the 12-year-old girl from one of the many hoods of our land Coming close, so close, not close enough to winning. That girl in her struggle for the word affords all of us poets, hip hoppers, rappers, spoken word and dub performers, space for a quiet shame that we can get over without knowing the words with which she had to struggle in the old time traditional slam called the spelling bee that many of us can get over without knowing the spelling of the pronunciation that it would have been demanded of our grandparents. It may be some of our parents too. We who would be wordsmiths for our prizes, high fives and fist bumps, and push cart prizes, slam titles, Pulitzers and Nobels, we are all reminded that all of that rests upon the shoulders of 12 year olds in spelling bees and struggling with knowledge that in the beginning is still the word. (laughs) 
after reading Orwell's Politics in the English Language. By the way, that's an excellent essay. I highly recommend people take a look at it. It's called Politics in the English Language. It's in several collections of, of uh, anthologies and stuff, it's a, but it's a real... I'm not going to say anything more about it. In all my years of reading, talking, never ever comprehended about if it goes without saying why it's being said. If, needless to say, whose need is being met by saying in the nature of that need, why I am told that someone else or myself fail to see what's trying to be gotten across verbally or on paper when it's not about failure but about careful and thoughtful consideration and just plain disagreement. Can someone explain the use of such phrases other than the user trying to come off looking cute at another's expense? For some reason, I feel insulted reading or hearing it said, and that should go without saying, should be needless to say. But we do have poetry slams, and they've been going on for the better part of 30 years now. And it's a great, it's a great, there are great venues across the country where people come in to do their stuff. And like any other venue, poetry venue or music venue, some of the stuff is absolutely great. The rest of it is not, you know, not quite worth writing home about. But what's important is that there's this mass, this place where masses of people that want to try their stuff get to do it and are no longer told that, you know, you don't know how to do this stuff. I mean, you know, stick, you know, just, just get through the course, pretend you're paying attention, but move on. So this poem is for the academics who... Uh, have a problem with this, with, with this, the slam. It's called, To Those Who Would Not Reduce Poetry to Numbers. People who don't like our poetry either never had or have forgotten that they once had mothers and fathers who played the numbers and then sometimes ran them and sometimes came home with something to show. Often, that five or ten dollars that got us over was the difference between hunger and starvation, between a yes or no to a filled prescription for the baby, cab fare to the police station, the morgue, or the courthouse. And every once in a while, every once in a great while, an offering in the collection plate to both give thanks and to stay in the loop with the Almighty. We who came out of those times and went on to write verse come from people whose lives were reduced to numbers. The boss's bottom line, the social worker's caseload, the police statistics for arrests and crimes, the number of deaths from homicide, AIDS, and that new world order of diseases conquered long ago by science, but now piggybacking on the backs of the builders of the Fourth Reich. Those who don't like our poetry just don't know what it means to count. But to tell the truth, we're in this for the fun and the insurrection of it all. And yes, we're in it for the occasional five or ten bucks. We learned a long time back that pride has its limits. I didn't just witness this, I interacted with this on a bus ride from 
San Francisco to Boston in 1986. It's called Omaha. At the bus terminal late at night, the souls and spirits of people come forth, tempered by long distance travel, for better or for worse. A three-year-old is getting what has got to be the hiding of his young life, an event building volcanically several hundred miles over 24 hours, the climax of an orchestration of infant and adult power plays, and the mother just lost it as she carries out a whooping of clear premeditation. By phone, she had ordered her sister to bring the belt as far back as Denver. We are in a low-intensity war where the enemy has sold parents the message, you are inadequate, child rearers, and your children are evil. And the message is brought to, bought in bulk by the infantile tons, infanticidal ton with deadly results. In another far corner of the terminal sits a young expecting mother and toddler son. She split on her husband three nights ago. Split from a man whose mind and temper oscillate between self-pity and homicide. She has traveled as far as she can and she will wait out the night in the bus station across town. This one's about to close. Unless she calls a relative or friend and asks him or her to travel an hour and a half to Omaha. <clears throat> she must decide that it's okay to expect this of someone at this time of night, at this time in her life, no questions asked. She finally drops a handful of dimes, nickels and quarters into the payphone. She just couldn't call collect. Somewhere in her mind is a need to pay more. Okay. How many of you, when it came time to learning how to write, were given the book Elements of Style? This is for you. Elements of Style. Apologies to Mr. Strunk and White. First, it was grammar. All those terms, all those schematic blackboard charts telling what kinds of words went where when speaking or reading. This was supplemented by penmanship. Using India ink and dip into inkwell pens, assuring that my mother would scream as she tossed yet another shirt to scrub out stains alongside my father's automotive industry leukemia-laden work clothes. Later, it was composition, also jammed down my throat, hated it with every bone in my body, except some moments of fun writing flyers and press releases for the movement and discovered I could really do this stuff if I wanted to. Then writing in prison, letters to the outside, rapping with fellow inmates, which meant that writing and talking, talking away too much, it served me well later in and out of college. Except that on campus, I rediscovered my hatred of writing things not of my own. Was I the only one who realized that 15 pages or more typed double space footnotes properly placed was so tortuous where only five pages triple spaced could say it all? But we were training to be real or wannabe rulers. And I suppose that it's par for the course to have so evil a skill to be mastered. The better to mesmerize and baffle people out of at least two sides of your mouth. When I discovered that I could write poetry and proceeded to do so, 
I finally cut through all this bullshit. And strangely, years later, my writing improved. It was as though I had become an outlaw fugitive from convention, and upon return was convention's master by virtually of knowing what laws to obey, having skillfully broken all of them. Got juice? Gravitas? Where are the young people we ask in this gray-haired assembly? I remember 40 or four years back, more years back, when the elders of that time asked the same questions and even books were querying to no end. The next year, we showed up and turned things, indeed, turned the entire world upside down. Don't worry about the kids. Just be ready to tell them the story and not sound suspiciously like we're lecturing, giving advice, pontificating. Just tell the story. Be the poet, the storyteller, the good listener. Save your hair pulling for the privacy of your bathroom. Um, back to slam poetry. I was called the East German judge in the, uh, up on the East Coast during the 90s. Um, so it's called slam poetry, East German standards of judgment. And it's a countdown, 10, 9, 8. 10. You won't get one from me. Your best from me, a 9.9. .9. In any event, this is about poetry, not scores. So, read the fucking poem. 9.987. Best explanation, expectations, if really good. I'll be judging on quality of reading content of the poem. I will recuse myself from your politics, especially if I like them. This is about a good or not reading of the fucking poem. 6.9 or 0.69. In erotic, in erotic poetry, this is the difference between reading the fucking poem and just plain filthy speech. I reserve the option to score higher. Six, just that, keep on coming back reading fucking poems. 5.75, three minute explanation, followed by haiku. 5.0, lower than a 5.5. This should teach you about conserving words in an otherwise read, badly read fucking poem. Four, three, two, one. If you scored this low, the one message you should take home is that reading the fucking poem was never about the points, and reading the fucking poem does not lead to winning the slam. And for purposes of full disclosure, no one has ever lost a poem, has ever lost a slam because of bad poetry, but always because of East German judges not intimidated by boos and jeers or booze-fueled cheers, but to even claim this bit of moral comfort and indignation. You first have to read the fucking poem. There will be no zeros. Dead poets never redeem themselves with subsequent chances to read the fucking poem. So in return for the reprieve, read the fucking poem and live, and nobody will get hurt. <clears throat> Thank you.